Professor Karama to giving us uh, prayers. And Professor Karama has had a stint with Kemri, and that is before he came to AMREF. And currently, he is the chair of the ESRC in AMREF and also has supervised several masters and PhD students. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly welcome Professor Karama and Pastor Rogo to give us a word of prayer. Good morning, shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, as we celebrate a great leader today within the AMREF community. God, your word tells us that we should give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, we bless the leadership of AMREF family and community. We pray for Dr. Gidenji Gitahi. We pray for his work assignment and family. Bless his endeavor in everything he does. We pray for the VC of uh, Amref International University, Professor Su. Lord, we pray that the light of your wisdom will guide him and lead him in all the days of his life. We pray that you strengthen the network and the partnership of AMREF as they impact and lead health initiatives in Africa. We bless the various teams that work to make AMREF a success in this continent. Father, we pray for impact and legacy. We pray that lives will be transformed. We pray that they will make wise decision and wise counsel. We pray, King of Glory, that they will have growth and multiplication in every assignment they are doing in this institution. We continue to pray that, Lord, you bless their initiatives in research and innovation. Bless them, Lord. Give them mentorship capacity. Bless them with networks. Bless them in every facet of their lives. And, Lord, for this day, we commit it to you. We pray that the light of your wisdom will rest upon this institution. We speak a blessing, Lord, even for those who are watching us online. We join together with them and we welcome them and we pray that, Lord, you will help them to keep focus, that they will not be distracted. We pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of God, most merciful, most gracious, our Lord, we stand in front of you today to confer professorship to one of our own. We pray that you guide him. You are the source of wisdom and knowledge. You guide him such that with humility, he may lighten the paths of those who seek knowledge and learning. We pray that you guide him in leadership so that he is a servant leader to those who interact with him and not a master leader. We ask that you bestow humility in him so that he demonstrates as a model for this institution and he may lighten the lives of those who work with him. And in uh, uh, I mean. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to take your seats. Take a seat so that we can have some entertainment and we'll have two groups which are going to entertain us. I will start with uh, the one that is ready, the one that you've heard their voices, the ones that have welcomed our academic procession and are going to be with us until the lecture has been delivered and we can celebrate it together as a successful lecture and the very first one 
to be delivered by our own and accorded by our own as well. I welcome Safari Voices International. Karibu sana. Thank you. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Lift the mic a bit. Can I use that one? Thank you. Remember to tell us about Safari Voices so that we can be acquainted. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a privilege to be here once again. Uh, we are part of this family, Safari Voices International. We are really international. We have traveled uh, to half of the world. Uh, we are Kenyan ambassadors, cultural ambassadors, uh, and we do our Kenyan music, African music. We do some music from uh, the rest of Africa and other parts of the world. So we are based in Nairobi. We sing in functions like this, corporate weddings, uh, state functions. We perform in all those uh, functions. I know this is your day. You don't want to uh, um, bring so many stories. But I just want to remind you, even if you are putting on that beautiful gown, it does not mean you cannot dance. Okay. I saw some of you are very, you know, feel free. That's why we are here, that we are able to celebrate this day. Amanam Nagan. So we are celebrating. So even, uh, and a celebration starts with a smile. If you are so sad, uh, we would wonder what to do. But please enjoy this. Uh, we take you down to South Africa. Each of Oh, <laughs> It's your Saram <laughs> Just 
One, two, three, four, five. Let's go. One, two. One, two, three, four, five. Let's go. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, much. Thank you so much, Safari Voices. And as they move out, we usher in the Amherst International University students, which is a group of students within the university who have found purpose in entertainment. And at this particular point, I want to usher them in to give us their set of entertainment. Karibu Sana, Amherst International University students. Shire, Shire, Bear, Shire, 
Thank you so much. Asante sana. Someone was asking me, what is that song saying? What was it saying? I want to challenge someone from the audience because you are all entertained to tell us what this song was saying, generally what it was saying. And I've seen someone. Odeb, come. Come and just tell us in a nutshell what this song was saying. Because Odeb comes from where this folk song, the language. Yes, where they speak this language. Good morning, everyone. In a nutshell, uh, the song is saying that they are praising Professor Sur for the work he has done because a meal is, glitter, is, is, is shining. Generally, that's what they are praising. Thank you. Wow, that, that's a great message for a great day. Towards understanding Senga Health, the scientific nexus of African sexualities and reproductive practices. Quite a handful, don't you think? How many understand what our theme or Professor Osur's theme for the day is? How many have a clue what it's about? How many are looking forward to understand what that theme is about? Thank you so much. I would like us to understand are seated at the front of this hall so that we know who is in this procession 
who else is seated in this room. And the person going to do this is Dr. Josphat Nyagero. Dr. Josphat Nyagero has been in AMREF as an organization since he actually joined AMREF in 1993. All right, in 1993. I think I was a very young boy. And that's a very good stint you've done because he has now grown to be a senior lecturer and the Dean of Students of AMREF International University currently. He is a demographer and a researcher professionally. So if you are looking for him, look for him on those lines. And just last month, he published his 43rd journal article with an intention that he is going to write a book. And he has also done a chapter in a book which I will not say the title because today is Professor Sur's day to read all his titles and to know how many books he has published. He is also an expert in public health. Karibu sana, Dr. Joseph Nyagero. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, what an introduction. Good morning. It is indeed a privilege to do the introduction on this day. And it is a day that we are going to have our first AMREF International University professor. He is going to give us our first or his first lecture. It's a great privilege. Now, we have a committee that organized for this day. I could like to introduce you to this committee. Those of us who are here, kindly stand up. This is the committee that has brought this together, led by Professor Tamari, who is our DVC, with Timothy Sato, Maybe just wave. Who is our registrar? Dr. Alice Lakati, who is the director for research, and one of our own, Beatrice, who is the CEO for AMREF. Then we also have Dr. Irungu, Dean for Graduate School, and Betty Buyuka Communications. Pleasure. This is the group that has brought us together. We thank you, we cherish you, and we look forward to all of us to enjoy this day. I also want to request the professors who are in this congregation to stand because it is important. Again, we know the professors that are already here, kindly stand. I'm expecting Professor Sur to also join to add the number because already he is, today he's going to give us his inaugural lecture and we are privileged. I want to introduce again, Professor Mohamed Karama. Maybe you can just wave, a good friend of Amref and one of our own, Professor Tamari, and finally, who is the DVC and finally our VC. Pleasure, most welcome. In our midst, we have the deans, heads of department, and also we do have uh, the directors. Let's stand so that we can be able to be introduced. We have at the back, Christine for physiotherapy. We also have Dr. Mika Matiangi, who is Director Odell. We also have Dr. Lucy Njiru, who is the Dean School of Medical Sciences. And once again, we have uh, Dr. Irungu, who is the Dean for Graduate School. We also have Francis Namisi, who is heading 
what we refer to as the disk short courses. Welcome once again. They are now the invited guests. We have a number of invited guests. I may not be able to recognize all, but it is important to mention that Professor Sur invited the nuclear family. It is with us, yes. And I'm requesting that those of us who are here kindly, let's stand so that we can be able to first welcome you. Second, to thank you for taking care of our professor. Kindly stand. We have Coret, Coretti, Osur, maybe Wave. She is the wife of Professor Sur. We also have Nick Osur, who is the son. We also have Nicole Osur, the daughter. And we also have Sylvia Akinyi, the niece. Thank you again and most welcome. Thank you for taking care of our professor. Now, there are others who are with us. We are aware that our chancellor, His Excellency Festus Mugai, the former president of Botswana is online. He may not be able to, is not here with us, but is following. We also have AMU Board of Trustees. We recognize, we appreciate you, wherever you are, and I'm sure there might be some here. Most welcome, they are following us for this event online. Then we have the AMU Council, ably represented here by the chairperson. This is Mtoni Kuria. I could like you to stand and wave the congregation, but I know you have something to tell us at the right time. Thank you and most welcome. Several bodies from the regulatory bodies, representatives of uh, the various bodies, regulatory bodies, the Commission for Higher Education, Professor Mike Kuria. We are expecting him. Ministry of Education, a representative, Daria Zogutu, should be joining us. Minister of Health, we also have the Association of Physiotherapists, Henry Opondo. He's right at the back, welcome and thank you very much for coming. The Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society, Dr. Eli Odongo should be joining us. The Nursing Council, Dr. Edna Talam. Yes. And the Kenya Medical Association are following us and we appreciate you. They are the partner universities, Utrecht University, virtually, University of Toronto, IFAC, and the University of Southern California plus the University of Edinburgh. They confirmed and they are online. Other partners, Kemri, we also have the APHRC and the Medical Council of Kenya. Yes, Christine Anguku representing. Thank you and most welcome. Thank you again for coming. Many AMREF staff across Africa, they are joined online. We appreciate and recognize you very much. The country offices, the Europe and Northern America countries, AMU staff, all of us who are here, we recognize and appreciate you. We also have the team of students who are here and we truly appreciate. And maybe it is good the SRC members who are here, 
for the student council? Yes, we appreciate you very much. And there are many other friends. All protocols observed. I want to say all of us are invited and this is the day we are celebrating and ready to listen to the inaugural lecture of our first professor of AMREF International University and importantly, our VC. Thank you again, most welcome. We can do better than that with our uh, Santa Sana so that we appreciate the guests who have taken their time to join us today, as well as the break that we have taken from studies today to recognize the basically the essence why we are all here in the university, because I think this is the height of academia. And Professor, having achieved this, we are, it's a moment for us to, to, to celebrate and to take part in proudly. Now, the next 20, 30 minutes, one hour, makes me a very small person because of my academic achievements vis-a-vis -vis the people who are going to hand over this mic, mic to. And just to run you through, Dr. Nyagera has, uh, has already opined to it that we are here to celebrate our first professor as a university. One that we have recognized for his work in terms of leadership. One that we have recognized his work in academia, his influence in research. He has risen through positions in AMREF Health Africa as an NGO, an indigenous Africa-based international health organization that has now grown through the leadership of Dr. Givinji Gitai to a position of recognition in matters public health, in matters of women, children, and community at large. Ladies and gentlemen, the inaugural professoral lecture shall be delivered today by Professor Joachim O. Osur. If I were him, I will put all my three names. I will not say O. So he'll tell us the O. So that professors have a tendency when they, they keep growing in, in the academia, they now forget the first name, Joachim. Now he calls himself Otieno Osur. I don't know why they do that, but maybe another, on another day we shall be told why they do away with that first given name, which is, I'll say, English, and they maintain their African or the indigenous names. We celebrate him because the council has recognized him, like I've said, for his work. And the people in this room are not just students. They are not just uh, support staff. They are not just academia. They are also partners. Partners who have seen a vision in AMREF International University. And you recognize that we are a university that has taken a very unique and special path in how we deliver our services. We are borderless. We are a university that is being led towards uncharted waters, particularly in Africa. And are we, do we feel like we are headed the right direction? Yes. Do we have the right staff to lead us in that direction? Yes, Professor Osur is already getting the recognition of what he is contributing in this area. And therefore, the stakeholders in this room, I want all of you to take pride in being part and parcel of AMREF Health Africa. And join me in the next one hour or so, receiving accolades 
going to Professor Osul. And the person who is going to introduce our guests and invite the speakers who are our special guests for the day is a lady who is a global leader in public health and research. This lady has particularly ventured into the realm of women and has done and contributed hugely to FGM in the African society and sexual medicine. You will remember that Professor Osur has deeply also gone into the area of sexual medicine. And I'm sure at one point we will be given the full profile of the man we are celebrating today. Now, before joining AMREF, she was the Dean and Head of Department of Health System Strengthening and Public Health at the Technical University of Kenya, having attained her Master's in Human Sexuality from Belgium and her PhD in Biomedical Sciences. She is one person, when you go to LinkedIn, you can enjoy her content because she talks it as it is, as it were, as it should be. And rather than listening to people who talk about, uh, you know, there are very so many, so many, and we normally have this debate about boring university courses, interesting ones, employable ones. That's a debate we'll never finish. But one that affects all of us in this room is sexuality. In a good way, in a bad way. And it's a very sensitive topic, especially in the African society to even talk about. But the professor we celebrate today does not miss his words, does not shy off, just like the person who's going to introduce them, Professor Tamari Esho, who is a Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and Student Affairs. Let's give her a round of applause to come and welcome us into the next part of this program. Asante Sana Karibu, Professor. Thank you very much, Mike, for that great introduction. Um, I would like to begin by recognizing the presence of the Chancellor of the University, His Excellency Festus Mugai, joining us online, the AMU Board of Trustees, um, AMU Council, um, Chairperson of Council, Ms. Mudoni Kuria, members of Council, representatives of the regulatory bodies, partner universities and organizations that are here with us today, AMREF Health Africa staff, family and friends, and everyone else joining online, all protocols observed. Uh, today marks a great milestone in the history of this university. As we celebrate the academic excellence of Professor Joaquim Mosur, making the first inaugural professorial lecture we are having in this university today. Thank you, Prof, for setting the pace, uh, and we hope that many more will follow in the future. So this could not have come at a better time. Just after we had launched our AMU strategic plan that stipulates the strategies for growth and expansion of this university in the academic and research field in health sciences. An inaugural professorial lecture is a formal public lecture that is given by a newly appointed university professor. It represents an opportunity for the newly appointed professor to showcase exciting, groundbreaking research and teaching that is happening, that he has done over the last few years. So promotion to full professorship follows the rigorous process in which an applicant's research, teaching, and service are thoroughly evaluated by peers who assess the quality and impacts of their contribution to the local, national, and international levels. So congratulations, Professor Sur, on your professorship. This is uh, your opportunity to sh showcase your research expertise and share your passion in the field with your colleagues, family, and wider academic community. It shows the evolution of your work, an overview of the work you've done over the years and that has contributed immensely in the scientific field. 
the societal impact of your work to individuals, families, and community, communities as, at large also cannot be understated. The academic division has thus, thus developed a policy with which uh, the guidelines for conducting inaugural professorial uh, lectures has been embedded. And this has been approved in the various levels in the university. So this begins to set a tradition, uh, a unique tradition for this university with regards to how these lectures will be taking place today and in the future. The policy stipulates uh, that a committee has to be constituted and you've heard already of the committee that uh, has been in place. The venue for the lecture, which is the campus grounds, the attire, we have the formal grounds because this is an academic ceremony uh, for professors, faculty, and also to the university management. And of course, also the uh, dress code, you can see majority of you here are dressed in black with a touch of red. So this is going to vary depending on the decisions of the committee to choose any of the university logo and colors that we have going forward. The academic procession, of course, is made up of professors, faculty, and UMB, uh, which is the University Management Board. The length of the lecture, which should take about 50 minutes, the timing of the lecture that should be done approximately one year into the appointment of the professorship. And of course, after the lecture, the gift sharing and also the luncheon to celebrate the professor in, together with his family and friends. At this juncture, I would like to once again, congratulate Professor Joachim Mosur on this uh, great feat. We shall therefore hear some speeches and remarks building up to the inaugural professorial lecture that will be the peak of this uh, event. It is now my honor to invite the chairperson of the AMU University Council, Ms. Muthoni Kuria. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tamari. Good morning, everyone. Um, distinguished uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm not going to go through the list of everybody who's attending, but I'd like to uh, recognize the Chancellor, His Excellency, Mr. Festus uh, Mugai, um, the Global Chief Executive Officer, AMREF Health Africa, Dr. Githinji Gitahi, AMU Board of Trustees, AMU Council members um, here present or um, joining us online. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege on behalf of the AMREF Health University Council to welcome you to the inaugural professor lecture at AMREF International University. As the university celebrates uh, Professor Joachim Osu's award of full profes professorship today, we would like to express our gratitude to each and every one of you, our stakeholders, as we observe this key academic milestone. Building a critical mass of fit for purpose leaders for Africa's healthcare system is crucial. The council takes cognizance of emerging global issues and the unfolding impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, humanitarian and poverty issues. These have been highlighted, uh, these have highlighted major racial, ethnic, socioeconomic and geographic disparities. This situation is further compounded by an in, inappropriate skills mix and gaps in service coverage, as well as lack of coordinated and standardized strategies or targeted investment to build a suitable and sustainable health workforce for Africa. As a council, we note that members of faculty continue to expand their areas of expertise and knowledge towards addressing these challenges. As we implement our 2022-2027 strategy, the council will execute its mandate of providing support and guidance to the university management with a key focus on development of human resources and research capacity. 
the council appreciates and support the support given to the university by AMREF Health Africa through the board of trustees to enable the university to meet the commission of education's requirement for adequate infrastructure and to build human resource capacity. As council, we will continue to seek support for guided and structured human resource development as this requires significant investment of time and resources. We are keen to ensure that as we implement the current strategic plan, the university will grow in the number of faculty and students engaged in innovation, research and extension in order to generate resources and assure financial sustenance. We commend the university management, faculty, staff and students who all put their efforts towards personal development as well as the continued growth of the university. We especially congratulate Professor Joachim Mosu for his research accomplishments and outstanding contribution in the field of sexual reproductive health. So as we mark this uh, key milestone today, Karibuni Sana, and thank you very much for joining us. And congratulations, Professor Osu. Um, it's now my honor and privilege to invite the group uh, CEO, AMREF Health Africa, Dr. Githinji Gitahi, uh, for the citation and introduction of inaugural professor lecturer, Dr. So, uh, Dr. Githinji will be joining us online. Dr. Givinji, we are waiting upon you. Karibu sana, Dr. Givinji Gitai, our group CEO, our Director General. Colleagues, Friends, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Gizinji Getahi and I'm the group CEO for AMREF Health Africa, the founder and sponsor of AMREF International University. As a young university, we are very proud for the conferment of full professorship to its vice chancellor, Professor Joaquim Mosur. Today, we celebrate the inaugural lecture of his professorial appointment, noting clearly that we are proud that this is the university's first full professor, which demonstrates that beyond its work on research and supporting programs, it is strongly founded in academic principles. This inaugural lecture, as happens in many of the universities, is a way to introduce the full professor to the student community, to the academic community, to the non-academic community, to our partners and to the general community, which therefore means that this is not purely an academic meeting. It's a meeting to give Professor Joachim Mosur an opportunity to demonstrate his skills, his academic skills, his professional skills that he's gained to the place he's gotten now until his appointment by the University Council to full professorship. This inaugural lecture, in our view, in our desire, would also serve 
to connect Professor Osuru's academic endeavors to our duty of serving community, to our duty of achieving lasting health change for Africa as an international NGO that lives and breathes its vision of ensuring communities in Africa are healthier, safer, and prosperous. The question then we would be seeking Professor Osuru to answer in his inaugural lecture beyond the celebration of his professory appointment is how does his work, his research, his academic endeavors connect to our communities that we live in, to the governments that we work in, and how does it eventually change community in line with our vision as an organization? We congratulate him, of course, for his achievements, and we look forward to him extending his academic prowess to furthering academic uh, ventures of others in the university, for our students, for our academic staff, and largely for those of you who are joining here who may then get inspired by today's inaugural lecture. So on behalf of the sponsor, on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the university, which represents the sponsor Amref Health Africa, I wish to introduce to you today, Professor Joachim Osur, and we celebrate his inaugural lecture. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for all joining in person or virtually. I am Dr. Givinji Gitahi on behalf of Amref Health Africa. Let me start by introducing myself. I hope I'm heard. I'm Dr. Alice Lakati, I'm the Director of Research and Community Extension. Chancellor Sir, Your Excellency, Mr. Festus Mugai, I'm your Board of Trustees, represented by Dr. Yudinji Gitahi, who has just spoken. I'm your Council, the Chairperson of our Council, Ms. Botoni Kuria, representative from regulatory bodies. I recognize Commission for University Education, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Kenya Association of Physiotherapists, the Nursing Council of Kenya, and all other invited guests. Professor Joachim Osur, our Vice Chancellor, and actually the reason why we are here. It gives me great privilege to read the citation for Professor Joachim Musur, and I'm going to read it. Professor Osur was promoted to the position of a full professor of sexual and reproductive health by the AMU Council on 25th of November, 2022. The promotion was based on his academic qualifications, research experience, teaching and student supervision, as well as community service and his standing among his peers in the profession. Academically, Professor Osur has a PhD in sexual and reproductive health a fellowship in sexual medicine awarded by the European Multidisciplinary Committee on Sexual Medicine, a master's in public health, a professional postgraduate qualification in clinical sexology, advanced diploma in family therapy, and a bachelor's in medicine and surgery. Professor Osur has undergone various training in management, including executive diploma in resource mobilization, jointly offered by the Kenya Institute of Management and Strathmore University, advanced certificate in social enterprise development offered by the University of Copenhagen, certificate in financial management offered by Cornell University, Associate Certificate in Alternative Dispute Resolution offered by 
Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, Certificate in Strategic Management and Leadership by the Chartered Management Institute in the UK, Strategic Leadership Development Program offered by the Kenya School of Government, among others. Professor Osur's research has been in the areas of reproductive health, sexual health, health systems development, and recently COVID vaccine hesitancy. He has published four books, A Clinical Protocol, 28 peer-reviewed papers, and 540 opinion articles published in various newspapers and journals. Professor Osur peer reviewed work has been cited 264 times. Professor Osur has used his knowledge and evidence in SRH to influence policy and practice among others. Among others, he was among the Africans experts that addressed the US Senate Committee on the Foreign Relations on the impact of US policies on SRH in Africa during the President Bush Republican regime. He also addressed the UN Commission on the Rights of the Children on the effect of the Kenya government policies on SRH of Kenyan children. In the recent past, Professor Osur is among the experts who have been involved in building the capacity of African parliamentarians on SRH through the network of African parliamentary committees on health that comprises parliamentarians from 19 African countries. Professor Osur was among the health leaders who actively advocated for the current Kenyan constitution, providing evidence on issues related to abortion, which was one of the contentious issues in the constitution. Professor Osur was a member of the Attorney General's Task Force on the implementation of the Sexual Offenses Act in Kenya. Professor Osur has been an expert witness in several public interest litigation cases in Kenya. He was an expert witness in a court case in which the government of Kenya suspended guidelines that health workers were using for reducing and save abortions in Kenya, making it impossible for services to be provided in health facilities and causing women to suffer complications, some ending up in death. He was also an expert witness in a case that sought to declare the law against FGM in, in Kenya unconstitutional. The litigant in this case said that FGM is a cultural practice that should be allowed and doctors made to do it for safety reasons. In both cases, the courts upheld the reproductive rights of women which is what Professor Osur was supporting. Professor Osur is involved in governance in various organizations. He is the chairman Moranga University of Technology, chairman Health Rights Kenya and International Board Member Center for Reproductive Rights. Professor Osur is a member of the editorial committee on the Journal of Sexual Medicine. He is also a member of the Education Committee International Society for Sexual Medicine. He is an advisory committee member for the African Society for Sexual Medicine. Despite his busy schedule, Professor Osur has maintained touch with his patients and he attends 
to five patients with sexual problems every week. He does sexuality education through his weekly column in the Daily Nation, which is among the popular reads in the newspaper. He is a popular speaker on sex and intimacy in sexual groups, both church and non-church based. He is, he is also a popular radio and TV show interviewee on sexual and reproductive health issues. Among was one of the most read writings about Professor Osu is that his grandmother wanted him to be an Anglican bishop, but he ended up being a sexologist. With that, I am greatly honored and it is a privilege to invite Professor Su to give his inaugural lecture. Good morning. Uh, it's nice to see you there. You look good. And uh, I feel pressure to say something. Um, I was actually wondering what I should say in this lecture. So I spent a number of days trying to put together what I would say, capture snapshots of the things I've been doing uh, in my profession. And so I know a number of colleagues here whom we have done a number of other things with, and they'll be wondering, why aren't you mentioning that? Uh, it is because we can't mention everything in 50 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I see a lot of uh, colleagues attending online, I think of uh, about 140, and I know a number of them have not been uh, appreciated. Uh, because we, it's hard to yeah, go through the whole list, but we really appreciate, I know, a number of uh, high-level uh, attendants uh, who had promised to be there, and we appreciate you. Now, uh, so my talk is towards understanding Senga Health, the scientific nexus of African sexualities and reproductive health practices. And um, this, this uh, whole topic, if you just go back, um, I think you're moving too fast. The slide with me, yes. This, this topic, which kind of describes some of the things I've been doing, or the main, many, many things I've been doing, uh, came about when I was in Uganda one time. And uh, one of my friends, a Ugandan, asked me exactly what do you do, because we've seen newspaper articles, uh, you are talking to, there's some members of parliament meeting about reproductive health, uh, you are doing programs, what exactly do you do? So I described to him what I do. He kept quiet and said, Sebo, you are just a learned singer. Sebo means sir. <laughs> And so I got interested because that was his conclusion. What is a, a senga and what is a learned senga? And that has taken me uh, time. And I then realized I'm actually a learned senga. Um, let me start. You'll get to know what a learned senga is. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Let me start by saying this, that scientific studies on human sexuality um, have been led by people outside Africa. Uh, if you look at um, the people who have led these studies before that we read in books, uh, they are not here in Africa. Uh, some of you who have um, an idea about the subjects in sexual medicine, reproductive health, know people like um, uh, Dr. William Masters and Virginia Johnson. Uh, and, and, and many of these people whose pictures are here and many others, uh, they've done great work. And in fact, I used a lot of their work in what I do uh, 
like Alfred Kinsey, let me mention. Alfred Kinsey uh, that did a lot of work on uh, sexual orientation and came up with uh, some of the tools we use to diagnose if someone is heterosexual or homosexual. Uh, we call it the Kinsey scale. And there are many other things done by these great men and women, but you realize they are not Africans um, doing this work. In the next slide, um, if you also go to, next slide, uh, if you also go to slide. Okay. Technical issues. Yeah, if you also look at human reproduction, so there is sexuality and reproduction. Again, you come to realize that a lot of the things we are doing in this profession were done by people from elsewhere. And uh, what you get to realize is that the cultures where these people came from, they were doing some things that scientists then took up and started studying. And when the scientists got evidence to support what these people are doing, they were then institutionalized and we use them today. And so sexual and reproductive health practices start with the culture of the people. They are doing something, then scientists come in, they start studying what people are doing, they generate evidence out of them, they say this works, this does not work, and what works is then institutionalized. I want to give you an example of caesarean section, uh, which has been it's said to have been part of human culture uh, since ancient times. But ancient times here, let me tell you, is not ancient times in Africa because I've not seen caesarean section in Africa. But in Europe and uh, Western countries, it was part of something that people are doing. And there are tales in both Western and non-Western cultures of this procedure resulting in lives of mothers and offspring, um, uh, you know, being saved. According to Greek mythology, Apollo removed Asclepius um, uh, from the mother's womb. Asclepius uh, is known to be the founder of what we call cult of religious medicine. So these, these start as people doing cultural things, scientists then get in, look for evidence and better them. And then they become what we practice as medicine. And so that has been the tradition, which then begs to the question, have Africans been doing anything sexually and in reproduction? Has anybody studied them? Are they written anywhere? So next slide. Which brings me to the question then, who is a Senga? Now that I was labeled just a learned Senga. A Senga is in Uganda, the Baganda people, the sister to your father or auntie. And I think other communities have titles for a Senga. Uh, some people call it Senje. Uh, there is a song, Senje, which uh, is popular. Yeah? <laughs> so, it so it is your brother's sister. Now, in Uganda, the Senga is a very important person because they teach the young people about sexuality, about reproduction, and they do it so explicitly. They actually demonstrate sexual acts. Uh, if you know the Baganda, they take these girls and live with them for some time. And even uh, there is something we call um, a clitoral what? Elongation. Uh, they elongate the clitoris. Uh, well, I think it's the labia minora uh, and the clitoris all together. And it's all meant to make the woman prepared to have sex uh, with the to be husband. And uh, the Senga is institutionalized among the Baganda. They cannot imagine a woman getting married without having passed through a Senga, because that would be a disaster of a woman, yeah? They teach you manners, 
they teach you how to behave they teach you how to take care of your husband and so a senga a muganda who has not gone through a senga as a woman cannot really make a wife in my next slide um go ahead next slide some of these practices are so institutionalized in the culture um let me give you again the example of the baganda the training goes on until the end the woman gets a spouse or a husband to be the procedures of the marriage are done and then the lady is escorted to the new husband's home and uh, the senga goes with the the lady and in fact if the senga realizes that the lady is having problems on the honeymoon night they are even allowed to go in and demonstrate things yeah now the senga and the family of the girl always hopes that the girl is a virgin and so the senga waits until morning and goes to inspect the bed sheets and if there is blood in those bed sheets the senga carries them and the family of the a man is, is supposed to then also give a goat that has never had sex to the senga to carry back home. And when the senga arrives home with the stained bed sheets and a goat which has never had sex, they slaughter it and there is big celebration because the senga has finally completed her work. And, uh, but the senga remains as a consultant. They will come back and ask if there are issues. So you see how the Senga is so important, which makes me feel very important. <laughs> because I'm just a learned Senga. <laughs> okay. But these institutions are also found in other communities. If you go to the next slide. Um, we may call them different things, Senga or other things, uh, but each community has institutions for ensuring sexuality happens, reproduction happens in a way that is acceptable and is, uh, does not cause stress or disease. Among the Ovahimba tribe of Namibia, when a visitor comes knocking, a man shows his approval and pleasure of seeing his guest by giving his wife to his guest to spend the night while he sleeps in another room or outside the house. Some of these practices are institutionalized. So I know some of you are saying, when can I visit the Ovahimba? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's go to, to the next. <laughs> the Shona, the Shona also of Southern Africa uh, have institutionalized some practices in the Shona community, intimacy is sacred and ancestors are invited to participate. And a recital of praise poetry happens during sex in which the husband and wife praise, encourage, and thank each other together with their ancestors in the act. In other words, it is not just Christians who see sex as divine, also the African communities, uh, but in a different way. I know the Christians don't sing hymns uh, during some of these acts. <laughs> so let's go to then Senga Health. What are we talking about? Senga Health is a cultural custodian. Senga, Senga is a cultural custodian of indigenous knowledge of the community on sex, reproduction, and family. The institution of Senga passes knowledge and practices from one generation to another. It has expertise in sex, provides sex education, mentors community members on sexual pleasure, relationships and reproduction. That is the institution of the Senga and it varies from community to community, whatever they call it. So Senga Health, Senga Health is therefore homegrown, culturally appropriate, sexual reproductive health based on local beliefs, knowledge and practices. That is what Senga Health is. My research has been an endeavor to understand 
and modernize the African institution of sexuality and reproduction, or what I call Senga Health. So that whenever we talk about sexuality, we know Virginia Jackson and others have done great work. We also want to see how the African practices progress uh, to become proven scientifically and to get institutionalized through the Senga Health agenda. So let's continue to the next slide. Um, I think if you look at one of my writings uh, in, the, in the journal called Conscience, uh, the topic put there is not dancing around the issue religion and rights in Kenya. It kind of summarizes what I'm trying to say. And um, I, I got an extract from there. This is what I, I got from uh, this writing again of mine. As a sexual health expert, I have slowly come to realize the importance of sex rituals among the Luo and other African communities. The Luo would, for example, insist that sex happens before the fields were planted with seed. Sex also preceded harvesting. Most other important occasions were marked by sex between couples. As I attend to couples in sexless marriages today, I realize how economic and other milestones in life are disconnected from, and in fact, how they discourage intimacy between couples. I am not surprised that we are having more divorces now within Christian families than non-Christian families, which still practice some of these rituals. These traditional sexual norms have been demonized and left to the heathens, so good Christians are at a loss when it comes to issues of intimacy. I think this extract from this uh, publication summarizes what I'm trying to say, that there are institutions within our cultures that were meant to strengthen the family intimacy between couples and to make sure that families stay cohesive. And among the Luo, it was so institutionalized that it made it impossible for even economic activities to happen unless the bedroom is alive. Yeah, but what we see today is different. What we see today is totally different. We are so busy as professors doing research that we've left our families. Yeah, uh, because we are doing research for six months in the field, we forget our families and uh, people are making money at the expense of their families. So I think this summarizes very well what we are talking about here. In the next slide, let me take you to more modern things. Um, I've done studies on family planning and I used to work for what used to be called Family Planning Association of Kenya. Uh, we did a lot of studies there uh, supported by IPPF and other international organizations. And I traveled Africa, went to many communities. One thing I've learned is that the concept of having children and stopping at the right time is very African. What I've learned from African communities is that people raise eyebrows if pregnancy happens at certain times. Yeah. It's not acceptable for pregnancy to happen at certain times. Uh, for example, in my culture, if you are a woman and you're walking around pregnant and your daughter is also pregnant, that borders on abomination. Yeah? It means at a certain point, you have to stop delivering. Yeah? And that is family planning. And also, if you are... Um, breastfeeding and you're pregnant, people raise eyebrows. So family planning is totally African. It's just that the way we do it is different. And because the way we do it is different and the way we used to do it is different, people are struggling with the idea of using modern family planning methods. It is not that they hate family planning. They just find it difficult using these new methods, which I've told you were developed elsewhere based on cultures that people had elsewhere. We need to find ways of developing our ways of family planning. In my studies, I've seen maternal age. Um, I did this projection about 20 years ago, 
and it kind of remains the same, that uh, the age at which women are ending their delivery uh, obstetric lives, when they stop giving birth, this age is increasing. And every 10 years, uh, averagely, there is an increase of two years. In other words, we are getting into a very dangerous stage where uh, 40 and 50 year olds will be struggling to get their first babies. Um, that has implications, of course, in obstetrics because the older, we call them um, uh, elderly primary gravida, the older you are in getting your first baby, the more the complications. And this is something that we are seeing. Um, we've seen, again, that projection that time I found that people will have three to four children as uh, their family size for a very long time. And we have not seen a big change in uh, fertility rates um, in the last 20 years, it's minimal. Um, and we have also, in my projections, I, I found, and we are seeing this, many single women going for tubal ligation. What does it tell you? It tells you that there are many single parents women are empowered to start and end their families without marriage. Uh, and spousal consent for those who are married still remains uh, very important. Uh, I think I'm on the next slide, just continue. One very interesting finding on religion is that religion does not contribute to decision-making when it comes to family planning. That is one thing I've seen which can take us back to the culture. Um, when you stop delivering, I think did not depend on when you're a Christian. It is very cultural. And religion today plays a very small role in decisions for family planning. Um, we have also seen a lot more education among women, which is great. And uh, because of this, there is progressive increase in acceptance of family planning, but of course, because of those uh, traditional things, we are still having uh, some challenges. If you go to the next slide, I just want to conclude on the family planning issue and the work I've done on family planning. Um, I have published a book which kind of summarizes a number of uh, the findings uh, that I had that time and which I have continued to monitor and remain kind of uh, uh, true to that research. Um, I just Googled this book. They are selling it at $56. Uh, dollars. Um, maybe after this lecture, many people will buy so that I also get rich. Um, so uh, the next thing, number two, I want to talk about is uh, integration of services. This is an area that I did a lot of work on when HIV was a real big problem. For those who remember, HIV was managed under the office of the president in Kenya. And in other countries, it was under other ministries. It was not a ministry of health issue. And that is because HIV at that time was really a problem. And so what I said that time is, we are seeing a lot, I was you know, providing sexual reproductive health services as a service provider. And I said, we are seeing a lot of patients coming for family planning. We can use this opportunity to do HIV testing, counseling, and provide treatment. We are seeing a lot of them coming for antenatal care. And so I thought it was so obvious because when you're providing services, you're seeing these things and you think everyone thinks the same. So one day I walked to the Ministry of Health, Division of Reproductive Health, excited. And I said, I have an idea. I know uh, we can increase uptake of testing because it was a problem. We can increase testing, we can increase counseling, we can increase treatment. And the idea I have is, let us not have standalone uh, testing centers and what we used to call uh, comprehensive care centers. Let's integrate them within family planning and then we will, and, and reproductive health. And then we will get these women coming. And uh, from there you can reach the husband, you can reach the children through testing and, and treatment. I was told uh, what you're saying is unheard of and it is impossible. 
and we will not allow it. That is what I was told that time. Um, IPPF, I went to, we were at that time working closely with IPPF and I said, you know, if we approach it as a research, possibly we can be accepted to do a pilot. And we started piloting integration of HIV and family planning and reproductive health generally. Uh, this became a very uh, uh, heated global discussion at that time. And uh, it became part of a WHO agenda called the Gateways to Integration. And some of the results we got from the pilot, if you Google and go to Gateways to Integration, you will find evidence that we produced that time, saying that this is the way to go. And integration of services is logical, convenient, saves cost, strengthens health systems, and meets the expectation of patients. In my uh, enthusiasm, then I said, you know, we can go beyond reproductive health and even integrate with other things. And uh, we started working on the link between HIV and the environment and how to integrate. Uh, and there are publications on that as well. But what I would like to say is that the expectation of the African is that the doctor knows everything. They don't expect that they come to hospital and you family planning. They expect that when they come, for those who are uh, in this uh, profession, when a patient comes, they will tell you, yes, I'm having pain here, acidity, but I'm also bleeding and uh, I have hypertension. So the disintegration of services is not something that is expected in the sector. And I'm happy that uh, that early work that we've done informed the kind of service delivery at primary healthcare that we have now. The third thing I want to talk about, because I was given 50 minutes as you have had in the policy, Post abortion care. When I graduated from the University of Nairobi, we used to have in Kenyatta Hospital something called Ward 6. Ward 6 um, was bigger than this space and it had beds. But when you stepped at the door of Ward 6, the stench that came out of Ward 6, you needed, and we, not, we didn't always have masks that time. We just went. Uh, of course, you adapt to that smell. It was bad. That ward was full of women who had undergone abortion, either miscarriage or they had tried terminating a pregnancy and they were there waiting to be taken to theater for what we called DNC, dilatation and curettage. It was done under anesthesia and we had to prepare theater, clean theater, and one patient comes after another and it would take like one hour before the next comes. But abortions complications were so common that uh, people were dying in Ward 6. Some were not reaching theater in time. And so when I started working, new technologies started coming. One was MVA, manual vacuum aspiration. And I know uh, uh, our, our pastor Rogo was here. Some people may know Dr. Kamarogo, who was my teacher and is related to Pastor Rogo, uh, he led what is called MVA, a manual vacuum aspiration, which was a faster way of treating these patients. And that took off very well. And we started decongesting Ward 6. But then there were other new technologies coming. And one of them was what we call misoprostol, which was uh, it's a drug which at that time was taken to be illegal because women could steal it and hide and use it to terminate a pregnancy. So it was not allowed, but it was somewhere in the vicinity. Now I led, I was part of many studies on how we can use misoprostol to even make post-abortion care better. And we did studies in Kenya, we did studies in Uganda, we did studies in Zambia, and we consolidated all these findings which I can summarize and say for the clients, they cherished it. It was non-invasive, it was private, 
you didn't have to go for a procedure which is invasive and people uh, you know uh, doing what they do and it was also very cost effective you just needed to take tablets at that point when we were doing these studies we said you have to stay in the hospital for some time because we don't know what will happen if you are not in the hospital but later on uh, we found that we, you can actually give this medicine and women who have had an abortion or a miscarriage can have the abortions completed safely at home and uh, without complications. Uh, if you look at what the health workers were saying that time, again, they were very satisfied. You know, when you're a health worker, especially in the public sector, you want to clear the queue. You want to make the ward decongested. You don't want people lying in ward six, waiting for two days to have a procedure. So they were very happy because it made their work light. And so those studies uh, have been published. If you go to the next slide, uh, uh, implementation of misoprostol for post-abortion in Kenya and Uganda. Uh, and there are many other studies I've not put here. Uh, it brought a lot of discussions. Uh, what you see there in, is that green or blue? A letter to the editor. There are many writings across the world, some discrediting this and others saying this is the way to go. And after we published these studies, we embarked on answering questions uh, from the global community. And uh, then we had other problems. The misoprostol was not accepted uh, in, in, in Kenya at that point as an essential drug. We did a lot of work uh, with uh, uh, my friend, Professor Karanja, who passed on recently, to have misoprostol included in what we call the essential drugs list. And misoprostol is now very available in many parts of the country. We came up, uh, develop, I developed tools on how to assess health facilities, how to assess and train health workers to be able to provide misoprostol safely in women who have undergone abortion. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, this led me to publishing this protocol uh, which is something that health workers use to provide misoprostol uh, for the management of incomplete abortion. Again, you will see, I don't know whether it is visible, but uh, this is work that I led, uh, supported together with my colleagues, uh, Professor Joseph Karanja, uh, Dr. Charles Chigundu uh, from Uganda, Makerere University, Mulago Hospital. Uh, may God rest his soul, he died of COVID uh, two years ago. Uh, Monica Gutu, who is still uh, leading an organization called Kimet in Kisumu, and Emily Nakirija from Uganda. Uh, this protocol was very important in introducing this service, which um, transformed the way we treat patients. Later studies were done. A lot of other organizations have done studies. Genuity Health is known for studies around this area, and this was their comment. Uh, on some of the work going on in this area, that providers are commonly concerned about treatment with misoprostol in women who they believe have interfered with their pregnancy. If a woman presents with signs of severe infection, she should be given immediate surgical treatment. Otherwise, misoprostol can be offered for treatment even if the drug was used to induce abortion. In other words, this has now become the norm. It is no longer contentious. In the next slide, my work around post-abortion care led me to discover some things. That uh, abortion was very common and is still very common. Every year worldwide, about 42 million women with unintended pregnancies choose to abort. Nearly half of these abortions are unsafe. And unsafe here, I mean done in the back street, by someone who is not a doctor, who is not qualified, using the wrong equipment and all that. Some 68,000 women die of unsafe abortion complications every year, leading this to be one of the, making this to be one of the leading causes of maternal mortality. Of women who survive unsafe abortion, we know that 5 million every year suffer severe long-term health complications. And so unsafe abortion is a serious public health problem. If you look at 
the story of unsafe abortion, it's an African story. The risk of death from unsafe abortion, those 68,000 deaths we are talking about, is highest in Africa. The risk is one in 16 women. If you compare that with Europe, it is one in 1,400, North America, one in 3,700, Latin America, one third is Asia, one in 65. So unsafe abortion and the deaths that result from it it's a very big African problem. Now, if you look at abortion laws across the world and how the deaths related to abortion relate to the laws, this um, uh, map of the world, which you see here with all those colors, correspond quite a bit to the deaths from unsafe abortion. Uh, red is where abortion is totally illegal. Yellow is where it is allowed for some reasons. Uh, blue is where it is allowed on request. In other words, we've done studies which show that abortions happen. Numbers seem not to be changing. Where they are legal, women are not dying. Where they are illegal, women are dying. That is the evidence we have. If you go to the next um, slide, then you find in Kenya, 300,000 unsafe abortions annually. This was a study that I was involved in, uh, um, led by APHRC. Um, and I know there is another study going on right now because this was done, I think about 10 years ago. Uh, we, are, we are now uh, looking at new statistics, which will come soon. So these are the numbers of abortions in Kenya. 20,000 cases of complications in public hospitals only. Uh, let me tell you, this is counted public hospitals, private not counted here. And we know that half of reproductive health services are offered in private health facilities. What we have found also in these studies is that unsafe abortion is a problem of the poor, slum dwellers, illiterate, rural women, and it is a sign of inequality, inequity, injustice. I did a study next. Given this, because everyone knows about abortion, and if you ask anyone in the streets, they will tell you that abortion kills. They don't even differentiate between safe and unsafe abortion. So I did a study looking at social networks and decision-making process for clandestine abortions in Kenya. Why would a woman who knows very well that this is a dangerous thing still go for it? In summary, it was a very interesting finding that before a woman goes for abortion, they consult with the family, with friends, with religious leaders, and then a decision is made, go for abortion. And it is also these same people who will identify the person to offer the abortion. And so it is a community decision for a woman to have an abortion. Our laws don't recognize that. They punish the woman and the one offering the abortion. Yeah. And uh, I got especially interested um, because women told me I also consulted my religious leader. So I got interested to talk to some of the religious leaders and I asked, in your opinion, why would you advise a woman to have an abortion? And the religious leader told me, there are some pregnancies that even God knows are not acceptable. And I asked, can you give me an example? <laughs> And he said, look, if, if the father has raped the daughter, even God understands that is not a pregnancy which should be carried. And I said, okay, I now get it. But this is what is happening in African communities. And this is the situation uh, why 300 and over women are aborting in Kenya every year. I then went ahead to study. So the decision is made for abortion, what are some of the practices? 
Again, I can tell you a lot of stories about how people are procuring abortions. They use various methods. I think what I, I want to say is the younger people and the poorer people resort to more dangerous methods. Some are self-inflicted, uh, some are done by people they know. Uh, as I was doing this study, actually, I came across two deaths of those women. And so the practices, very worrying. And if you continue, I also discovered that, uh, next slide, a number of communities still go to the herbalists for this. And the herbalists have some of the most dramatic practices of abortion. I met this girl who had gone to the herbalist. It was like, we call it snowballing. One telling me so-and-so also went, you can also talk to so-and-so. And I talked to her and her story kind of um, made me feel bad. So she went to this herbalist early when she missed her periods. The herbalist told her, wait for six months. It is easier to terminate when it is six months. And so she waited and she went back and she told me I accepted to terminate the pregnancy, but it had to be done at six months. At that time, six months, I was given herbs to drink three times a day. After one day, I developed labor like pains. I expelled a formed baby. It was alive and moved its legs and hands. As advised by the herbalist, I just left it on the ground. It breathed for some time, then went quiet. I dug a hole and buried it. There was no funeral ceremony or anything. I did not consider it a child. These are the practices in the community. Uh, we have there, I've done a number of other studies um, with colleagues uh, around stigma, around the issue of abortion. And um, again, we can talk a lot about this. We did four counties. And in those four counties, we discovered in, in brief, the higher the stigma, the worse the practices. The higher the stigma on abortion, the worse the practices. So in places where people talked about abortion more freely and all that, it was less um, uh, dangerous. Now comes the constitution debate. As I was doing all these studies, Kenya decides they want a new constitution. And uh, those who wanted the new constitution said that uh, for two, over two decades, we, the people of Kenya, set out to change our constitution so that we could once and for all do away with an, with an all-powerful imperial presidency emasculated parliament and judiciary, lack of checks and balances between arms of government, skewed re re representation, a de jure multi-party, de facto one party, ethnicized civil service and armed forces. I want to say there was a good reason why Kenyans wanted a new constitution. But then abortion became, for those who didn't want it, it became one of the issues why they didn't want um, this new constitution. And uh, one of the materials from that group read like this, the interest of the moral majority will not be catered for uh, in the proposed constitution. And they talked about the issue of right to life and how abortion will be made easily available and how uh, even mortuary attendants would be doing abortions on women. It became really contentious. I led a team of my colleagues and we said, you know what? We cannot allow myths to determine whether Kenya gets a new constitution. And so we started giving information. I was lucky because I had been doing studies around this. We started talking about what we were seeing in hospitals. We took people toward six and similar words to see what was going on. And we said, people do not have abortions because it is lawful or not. As I've told you, the decision-making process, there is not any law anywhere. 
they have abortion for their own reasons. And the rates of abortion don't differ whether you are in Africa or in Europe. And so we cannot use abortion to determine a constitution for a country. If you go to the next one, um, and so at the end, as you know, Kenya got a new constitution and with a very balanced language on the issue of abortion, that abortion is not permitted unless in the opinion of a trained health professional, there is need for emergency treatment or the life or health of the mother is in danger or if permitted by any other law. In other words, even as a health worker, you have to counsel, look at the circumstances and say, this is legal or illegal. That is how it was balanced. If you want to know next, if you want to know more about this very controversial work, um, Goretti, my wife will tell you that nights I was scared because uh, after talking, there were threats uh, that you're promoting abortion, uh, despite uh, saying that I always used to start by saying I'm a Christian. I believe in God. And then I would say what I have seen in clinics and in the community, but people still thought that we were promoting evil and things like that, and it became very difficult. You can read a lot more of these uh, in this book, which I've written, The Great Controversy, A Story of Abortion, the Church and Constitution Making in Kenya. Uh, it has remained as a great reference, and I see it being used in many jurisdictions now. Jokindungu, and I'm not sure if Justice Jokindungu is online. I told her I would be talking about this. Uh, we worked very closely together during the constitution making process, and she did the forward for this book. And this is what she had to say. I accepted to write this forward without hesitation, not just because the central theme of the book focuses on reproductive health and rights of women, but that this narrative is one not only from a male perspective, but also from a medical professional viewpoint. For many years, the debate on abortion has been seen either from a religious and moral standpoint or from a women's rights and feminist perspective. This book clearly shows that the matter at hand is much more complex where there are many competing gender, scientific, religious, and philosophical considerations. That is what Joki had to say after she read this book. We, after the constitution making process, we realized there was confusion in the country. And I led a team of colleagues. We decided we needed guidelines for health workers to use because there had been a lot of talk about abortion and how it will be easily available. We came up with guidelines, which was very consultative. We involved religious leaders, we involved um, civil society, we involved the government. Um, the government actually was in lead and they signed off this document called Standards and Guidelines for Reducing Mobility and Mortality from Unsafe Abortion. And basically it says, prevent unwanted pregnancy. If it happens, provide non-judgmental counseling. If someone ends up with abortion, let it be safe. That's how I can summarize it. It was implemented for one year and then withdrawn because some people said, you know what, uh, this thing, someone can use it to justify an abortion. When it was withdrawn, there was confusion. And uh, people started turning women away, even the ones with miscarriage. And we had a few deaths. We went to court. And those who are in the circles, you know, a three-judge bench, no, a five-judge bench was um, put up by the chief justice to look into this issue. And the guidelines were reinstated by that court. I was an expert witness in that case. However, these guidelines remain somewhere. You can use them if you like, because they are legal. But we've not put money to implement them because of the contention around them. Next slide. Because of the work on abortion, there were some outstanding doctors on the side which was saying, let us allow this constitution to pass. I think I was seen as the leader of that faction. Among the doctors who are saying, this thing is dangerous, 
uh, was my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Jean Kagia. I invited her for this talk, and she said, I, I want to listen to that talk. I'm not sure she's online. We developed a discourse around abortion, which changed a lot of things. And the Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society, to create peace between us, as they said, <laughs> called us during their conference and awarded us uh, prizes. So I got an award and Dr. Jean Kagia got an award. We are good friends. Jean is my sister, elder sister, and we continue to work together. Next, my fifth, I'm almost done. Sexual gender-based violence. I've done a lot of work there as well, as you had. Uh, I've also been in the task force that the Attorney General uh, put up uh, to implement the Sexual Offenses Act. Um, recently, there was the issue of Nyeri women eh? cutting the manhood of their men. You heard about it. So I wrote something about it. And um, one of the studies done in St. Paul's University by Mudoni, not our council chair, uh, Mudoni Kingori, uh, and, and published took a quote from my writing and said this, a neutral story that does not blame the woman for the violence has a heading that reads, there is more to Nyeri violence than meets the eye, so we should not be quick to judge Nyeri women. Uh, it continues to say the story is an opinion piece written by, uh, of course, myself, a columnist who writes about sex matters. The article frames the Nyeri woman as a woman who is frustrated and traumatized, one who uses assault on male, on male manhood as a way of venting out her frustrations. I don't know whether that summarizes what I believe about Nyeri women and violence by women, but I just want to say I do not support violence of any sort between spouses or people who are in love. If you go to the next slide, I've written uh, a number of, uh, uh, you know, reported studies on violence, uh, including connection with HIV and unwanted pregnancy and conflicting policies and all that. And also uh, more recently, a lot of work on FGM. But one thing I want to say about SGBV is that it is rampant and has adverse consequences and many forms of SGBV cannot be legislated, maybe the physical ones only. And sociocultural interventions are important in eliminating SGBV. And I now go to number six, which is, um, I think, something that people really like to hear, sexual medicine. I continue to see sexual medicine patients. And uh, unfortunately for you, at every age, people have sex problems. So in your next age, you will have them. Uh, it seems not to spare anyone. <laughs> uh, the commonest problems are between the ages of 41 and, um, and, and uh, actually 31. And, and 45 is where we see a lot of problems. Of course, these are now married people and so on. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, the, the kind of problems that we are seeing in Kenya, a lot of men are having erection problems, ejaculation problems, low libido, uh, some are anxious uh, when it comes to sex, they want to run away. You know, like when you see a lion, sex addiction, sexual pain, we are seeing all this. But the message I want to pass, what I've seen, is that a lot of sex problems are related to other, they are a symptom of another problem. And we are seeing a lot of hypertension, uh, high cholesterol, low testosterone, diabetes, obesity, um, as the cause of these problems. So lifestyle issues, basically. And um, social factors, very important. Poor sleep, poor sleep. 
there are people here who sleep for two hours. I was talking to one of my colleagues, let me not tell you the name, and he started driving at three the other day in the morning. Uh, we are very busy, yeah? so poor sleep. And it is common among academics, eh? because we write our papers in the night, eh? so we don't get enough sleep. So poor sleep is a very common cause of sexual problems. Alcohol, alcohol, use of alcohol, very common. Stressful lifestyles, very common. Relationship problems. People are having a lot of relationship problems and they are coming to the clinic. When they come, they don't tell you we are fighting. They tell you, I have no feelings. Yeah? Next slide. Ejaculation problems are very common and uh, cutting across ages, but becoming more common as um, more obvious as people age, um, simply because their frequency of sexual acts go down and so their poor performance is easy to notice. Yeah? Because if you are young, you are active. You know, I have a friend, uh, uh, he's now associate professor also, gynecologist. One day he calls me and says, I'm calling you from the toilet. And I'm asking him, what is going on, Dr. Ari? I'm in the clinic and there is this young man who has come and says he has a problem because He's been having sex like three, four times a night, and now he can only have it once. And so he was asking me, I'm now wondering whether I'm the one who is abnormal or the patient. <laughs> because um, as you age, I think in, in his age now, uh, some of those stories don't apply. So as you age, the frequency goes down. So if you had a problem, it becomes more obvious. Uh, on the female ones, these are the common problems uh, that I see. Uh, low libido. Performance skills deficit is a diagnosis which means simply, sijui nifanya nini in Kiswahili. They don't know what to do sexually. <laughs> Sexual pain and orgasmia is lack of orgasm. And sex aversion, uh, you know, just not wanting. Um, some of the things associated with uh, what these women are suffering from, menopause, FGM, very common, but social factors, commonest is relationship problems. Again, poor sleep, stressful lifestyles, and women are also getting into alcohol. And so the point is when a sex problem happens, it is never the sex problem. There is an underlying issue and that needs to be attended to. Next, if you look at couple problems, I think this was also highlighted in the demographic and health survey, infidelity. Almost half of the people having sex problems have an issue with fidelity. Um, sexlessness and intimacy problems, they are the top. I want to move very fast towards the end next. You can read a lot more of some of these interesting findings in sex uh, from this book I've written. Uh, it's called Chama Voices, African Women's Perspectives on Intimacy, Love, and Sex. And uh, the forward given by Dr. Patty Britton, which is uh, one of the very renowned um, sex therapists, uh, sexologists, sexuality educator. She says, I find this book an important resource to anyone who wants to understand sexuality in Africa, I also find it a critical read for people who want to be sexually literate. 
Um, my latest publication on sexualities on sex, sexual function and COVID. And I just want to say a lot of men had erection problems during COVID because of stress and loss of income. And uh, being put together to live with their wives, uh, they were having problems being in the house most of the time. Incidentally, a lot of women were very happy. Yeah. So if you read this paper, you will see that my final uh, issue is financing of sexually productive health. This is a big headache. Um, in my passion to find financing, I, I went asking even the corporates, the corporate sector, if they would fund some of these sexually productive health things. I was surprised they just don't want. And so it is not just the government putting little money or uh, other donors, when the corporates, they are saying these things are controversial, we want to keep off them. Funding for family planning was initially left to donors, even government didn't put money there. About 20 years ago, together with colleagues, we did a lot of advocacy, now it is being partially funded. Commercial insurance excludes a lot of the problems I've talked about. NHIF, NHIF, NHIF has been in the news, could actually be a vehicle for advancing poor quality sexual reproductive health care. Let me give you an example. Linda Mama, which is fully funded by NHIF. If you deliver in a health facility, the reimbursement is 3,500. Tell me which hospital has clean linen, disinfectants, qualified health workers, enough clean space to sleep, which will deliver women, and for each delivery, get 3,500. It can actually be, it is actually a vehicle for promoting and advancing poor quality of care, and I think we need to talk about it. Donor funding can be specific and does not allow um, comprehensive services. We're having problems with that, and I hope that can improve. In summary, it's been a long one. I don't know how long I took, but this is my summary. Senga health is homegrown, sexual reproductive health, and quality Senga health starts with understanding a people's culture around their sexuality and reproduction through exploratory studies. Giving scientific touch to local sexual reproductive health practices is important in improving Senga health. Advocacy and policy development are important for institutionalizing contextualized sexual reproductive health practices, which we are calling Senga health. And sustainable models of funding of these services need to be developed to improve access and quality. I say thank you very much for listening to my long lecture. Wow, wow, wow. Professor Joachim Osur, congratulations. You know, he kept saying, I want to move very fast, but some of us felt like he should have gone on and on and on. Wasn't that wonderful? It was wonderful. Congratulations, Professor. And while listening to you, one of the countries, if I was asked right now, I loved it for its beauty, but if I was asked to move from Kenya, I think I'll move to Namibia. So, so <laughs> I'll be visiting so many of my friends who have just wedded. And, um, and as a, I mean, you present, uh, you may have seats, your seats, uh, you you present dilemmas in your uh, various dilemmas in your in your in your inaugural speech. Uh, you know, someone listens to you and you say men men's libido goes low when they consume alcohol, but when you check men, women, it's just ten percent. So, meaning, uh, if I was to be a layman and think opposite, then does alcohol make them their libido go high? I don't know. So, the, the, that probably one of the problem which maybe during COVID. 
most men who are quiet here will tell you they were going through. And um, the great controversy. You know, you opened that one, I thought now you are going back to your Christianity because have you read that book? You know that book by who's an SDA here? Helen, Helen G. White. Ellen G. White. So you're, you're still in your medicine, you're still having controversies just like the Christians do. And I think that's something you've really bring, brought out that to advocate for the sexual medicine and the SRH, you find yourself at the crossroads of what is right in your Christian life and what is right for medicine so that life, you can preserve life. And your strength can be seen from your publication that you have resilience to preserve life. You have the, the concern about women, children, and their health. And the best part is that you also have your concern about men also. I mean, sometimes we talk about reproductive health and we think it's meant for women. But you notice he also uh, have us on things that do, do with men. Um, I, I'd want, and, and Professor Tamari is a, one thing I did not mention. She's one of the most senior members we have in our culture change group. Actually, she's the most senior. And I usually feel so humbled to see her. Um, I'm the culture lead champion in Kenya, and I feel so humbled to see her uh, joining us as champions for culture. And one of the things you've mentioned that, that affects sexual, uh, around sexual health is stressful lifestyle. And I would just want to, to just, uh, take this opportunity to talk about to remind you about burnout like as you continue working for the university as you continue delivering your services for the communities you serve don't travel and forget your families do not kill yourself working so late at the office and, and arriving so early and taking so much that you propel that dis, uh, disabler burnout. Because as you see, Dr. is professor is saying, stressful lifestyle actually affects your, your SRH and, uh, and therefore your families. Now, I'll conclude by saying, if I was to choose a doctor for, to see a doctor for sexual re and reproduction health, you know, I noticed and I was talking to the Dr. Nyagero, there was something about people, the, the curve, about people going to seek professional help. Did you notice that when it goes to 60, there were no women going to see doctors about their performance and about what's going on in their life? But the men, they're still going to ask, like, Daddy, what is the problem now? You know. So it, I concluded that probably the best doctor to see for reproductive health is an aged doctor. They will tell you the questions the, the professor was answering from the toilet. They will answer them because they have already walked that whole journey. And some of the things they don't have to use medicine to talk to you, they'll use their own experience, but they will not tell you the experience. So he's listening to you and he's telling you, relax. Because maybe for the last one month, he has a problem, but he's because of his age and he's quiet. So I think uh, those are the key points that I think on a, on a light note I picked, but there, it's a, it was a very interesting. And if you feel that you learned, at the same time, you got entertained. At the same time, you got inspired by a professor who, do you think the council was right by recognizing and according him full professorship? If you feel so, I want to hear you stamping your feet. All right, that is accolades to you, professor. And to continue this celebration, I want to invite the AMU students. They are going to give us another traditional song which is called a dodo dance. A dodo dance is basically a Luo traditional dance. Luo's are very skilled when it comes to celebrations. I think their songs, even if you're not a Luo, sometimes you listen to the songs and you're nodding, you don't know what you're listening to. So we are going to have another one, which is going to celebrate Professor Osur as a leader. It is going to uh, celebrate him as a scholar, a father, and a wonderful man from Siaya. Siaya is in the Luo region of Kenya for those who might not know. And therefore, we, that is, I think that's why the choir chooses these songs because they want to take him back home to celebrate him as a hero. So Karibu Sana, the Army students, let us have some entertainment from you after that. Uh, we are gonna have Safari Voices International and as they'll be setting up, 
The entertainment will play you the Senje song, Sauti Sol, so that you understand that Daktari is not just serious, he also has time for entertainment. Karibu sana, I'm your students. I Thank you, thank you. Uh, Santa Fana, Santa that was nice and lovely. Um, you need to you need a song that I will throw to the whole audience, the whole group that is with me here. And if you're ready, are you ready? Are you ready, sound? In the meantime, um, Safari Voices International, you can take stage. 
as as we see if this would work and if not you have the honors to see that we have a presentation from you and then we will do gifts and close this as we go for a photo session whenever you're ready Okay. There goes our Sanjay song. Do you have it? Safari, Safari voices will take us through this. Karibuni. Anyone and on the child, and I think I Thank you. 